making a visit to South Georgia Island today. This is South Georgia Island, and those little spots that you can see on the beach there are king penguins uh, in, a, in a large colony on the island, a bit more uh, dignified than their, their smaller penguin relatives. Uh, though, as, as we saw the other day, babies, uh, juveniles are uh, brown and, and uh, rather odd looking. This one begging for food from, from a parent. Uh, and here's uh, another picture of some, some juveniles, just uh, a bit, bit awkward looking, if you ask me. Uh, here's, a, I guess, a royal procession of king penguins. Um, and they do kind of crowd together in these large, large colonies. And uh, this is an example of courting behavior. And apparently, I'm not, I don't know how, but scientists have determined that king penguins recognize each other through the sound of their calls rather than by sight. So they'll like walk by each other unless one of them makes a noise, at which point they'll know who it is. So apparently even, even to king penguins, uh, all king penguins look the same. <laughs> All right, what questions do you have uh, about <clears throat> processes, exceptions, the lab, anything we've been working on? Jane? Is there any way to make, it, um, make the lab more efficient with implicit, or is it really recommended to explicit to make it more efficient going through that thing in this amount of time? So as I posted on, on the forum, the the problem with the implicit, the biggest problem with the implicit free list is it has very poor throughput because it's searching so, uh, through all the blocks on the heap. So there are optimizations that can improve memory utilization that work equally well on an implicit and explicit free list. But at least I do not know of a way to solve the uh, throughput problem with an implicit free list because you'd have to have some way of searching fewer blocks when looking for a free block. Um, so maybe there, uh, maybe you might come up with a way to do that that isn't all the way to an explicit free list, but that is the purpose of the explicit free list. Other questions? I'm pretty sure I didn't answer this one, but like, when that W list for the explicit it doesn't matter the order of like which free is, which is the previous and the next when it comes to addresses, as long as all the free blocks are within the W of the list. That's, so that's, I can take my newest free block and add it to the front of my list, and that will work. Yeah, so the, I would recommend always just inserting at the head of the free list, all the free blocks there, the order doesn't matter. Um, a kind of related point is, when you're implementing the explicit free list, kind of everything about the implicit free list is unchanged. Like all the headers and footers are still there. You still find the neighbors, the neighboring blocks in the heap the same way. You still coalesce the same way. And all that has changed is when you go to find, find fit, we'll now search and uh, this linked list instead of just searching the whole heap. And then, on top of that, there are various times when you need to add or remove blocks from, from the free list. But uh, other than that, it's kind of not changing anything about how the heap works. Any other questions? All right, so today we are talking about input output. This will wake up for me. Make it not fall asleep. All right, and the uh, the overview of, of what we're looking at today is that if we have a C application that needs to do some kind of input or output, this could be reading or writing a file, this could be printing, uh, this could be uh, reading or sending information over the network. We'll talk a lot more about that on, on Monday. All of this falls under IO, input output. And there are kind of three groups of functions to do input output that we're going to look at. The one is the, the Unix IO functions, these 
system calls that are part of the operating system kernel, uh, where a C program asks the kernel to do some sort of input or, or output. The C standard library has a set of functions uh, to do various kinds of input output. And the textbook provides what they call robust input output functions or Rio functions, which are particularly useful for doing stuff over the network. We'll be doing that in our final lab, lab five. So gonna talk about that today as well. And both these C standard library functions and the Rio functions are built on top of the Unix system call. So the kernel is the, the part of the system that can read the disk, send stuff over the network, and the application is always asking the kernel to do this, but may have kind of layers on top of that to make the interface more efficient or, or more convenient in some way. Eric. Well, what do the Fs and the S stand for in that? <laughs> The C standard library has the ones that begin with F uh, operate on a file. And here, file, as we'll see today, has a maybe broader definition than you might think. Uh, the ones that start with S operate on a string. So S scan F uh, we encountered in, in lab two as a way to take a string and parse it, scan it into different things. Whereas F scan F would take a file, like an open file, and would be parsing stuff out of that. All right, so let's start with what is a file on Linux? File is just a sequence of bytes coming from somewhere. Could be on the disk, could be something else. Uh, and uh, the first byte, the second byte, all the way up to some m minus one byte, m's the length of, length of our file. And something that's cool about Linux is that all input out, output devices are represented as a file. So for example, the file located at slash dev slash sdv2, this is the file representing the hard drive where uh, the slash user directory is stored. If we're connected via uh, a terminal, that might be represented by the file tty2. Uh, the kernel itself is even represented as a file. There is a slash boot directory that might have something like a file, something like this, and the kernel is just a file sitting on the hard drive that the system loads into memory when it boots up. There's also a file slash dev slash null, which is like a, a, a void, a black hole. You, any input you send into to dev null gets uh, vaporized. So if you want to run a program that's going to print out a lot, but you don't actually want to see it, you can redirect the output to dev null, and uh, it will, it will uh, meet, meet its, its untimely demise. So another. Uh, sort of interesting thing about the uh, uh, Linux file system is if I get onto a Linux machine, the AWB, there's a directory slash proc which contains files for the kernel itself. Like this, uh, these are all files representing different kernel data structures or, or settings. Yeah, Sam. What are all of the letters past the A? Uh, yes, this is my attempt to write the word <coughs> generic. I tried twice, and uh, oh, this is this is a nine. Eighty-nine. Was it genie? Yes, I, I gave up. Um, but thank you for for 
uh, helping me clarify that. So, uh, for example, if we were to print out the file uh, proc meminfo, it would give us a bunch of information the kernel is maintaining about the state of memory. How much total memory, how much free or available, what is cached, uh, all sorts of different stuff. So all these directories with numbers, those are actual processes running on this system. And the kernel is maintaining information about each process. And in a moment, we'll, we'll look in and see what those are. But it's all to say there's uh, a lot of ways the file system uh, is used that is distinct from just storing like a text file on the disk. So because we have kind of all these different kinds of input-output represented as files, there's kind of a small interface that Unix and Linux provide for interacting with files that can be applied to uh, uh, files on disk, uh, uh, network sockets, all sorts of things. And so we have the open and close functions. Uh, open is going to say, tell the kernel, please get this file ready for me to read. Close says, I am done reading this file. There's actually a function to read bytes from some open file or write bytes to some open file. And there's also a function called lseek, because how a file, an open file is actually represented, remember it was the sequence of bytes. And when a file is open, <coughs> The kernel is going to maintain a kind of current position k of index into our array of uh, our sequence of bytes. And we can use the lseek function to change the current position that we're at. But we're just maintaining information about where in the file we are, we're currently reading. Questions so far? All right, so let's talk about types of files. Uh, one important type, a regular file, just uh, a good old normal file. It's going to contain some arbitrary data and uh, this could be a text file, something that contains, say, bytes that are ASCII characters. Could be a binary file, like a compiled program, a JPEG image, uh, something that, that's not ASCII, ASCII text. And the kernel, from the kernel's perspective, it doesn't know the difference between a text file and a binary file. It's just a sequence of bytes. Uh, at the level of the operating system kernel. And something about text files in particular, okay. is that we have the concept of lines of text, and so we need some character that marks the end of a line of text. And uh, The uh, character backslash n, or hex a, is our, our new line character, except Windows or networking use backslash r backslash n as the line ending. Uh, the names for these come from the days of typewriters. Uh, the N is sometimes referred to as LF for line feed. 
That's the handle on the side of the typewriter. And then <coughs> the slash R is the carriage return or CR. And so you'll sometimes see this as a file has LF line endings or CRLF line endings, usually based on which operating system it was created on. Just some, uh, a, a, I guess, historical nuisance that, that we are, are cursed with, <laughs> that this is not standardized. All right, so that's regular files. What's another kind of, of file you've, or thing that you observe in your computer's file system? Executables. An executable would be an example of a, a binary file. Oh, so it's just a file that has some, some data in it. A folder, yes. Or as they're called on Linux, a directory. And these are just an array of links to the files contained within the directory. And so a directory is, is a kind of file that is just a set of, of pointers or links to other files. Each directory contains at least two entries. There is dot, which is A link to the directory itself, as a way to specify like something inside the, the, the current directory. And there's also two dots, which are going to link to the parent directory of, of the current directory. And if you think about uh, trees, uh, as I'm sure you have seen, uh, seen before, our directory structure can be uh, a thought of as a tree. The kind of, uh, on Linux, the directory structure has a, has a root slash. This is kind of the, the top of the hierarchy, the, the directory that contains everything that's part of the file system. And then there are different directories within that. Home directory, my home directory, which has a file, hello.c. And so when we want to specify the location of a file uh, on our system, uh, we do so with kind of starting with a, a slash, and then the first directory in the root directory kind of descending on down from there to get to the file we want. So it would be slash home slash awb slash hello.c would be what's called the absolute path to uh, the hello.c file. That this specifies the full path from the root all the way down to the file we're looking for. We also have the idea of a current working directory, or CWD, and that's the directory that a program is, is uh, a process is running in. When we've used a terminal, we know that it's in a, a specific directory, and we can use CD to change which directory it's in. And we can also specify a path relative to the current working directory. So let's, for the sake of example, Assume that our current working directory is slash home slash mti. Then the relative path to the hello.c. Anyone have a suggestion for, for what our relative path would be? Uh, basically, describing a path from mti to the hello.c. Yeah, we go up one from mti. 
then into AWB, then into hello.c. Does that make sense? All right, so how do we actually work with files? Uh, talked about our, our uh, Unix IO system calls we have, so let's actually uh, see how this works. So I will go to a scratch directory. I will open up files.c, and I've, I've started uh, uh, something here. So I have included a couple headers, which are not from the C standard library. These are kind of Linux provided uh, headers that define Linux uh, provided functions like the open. And oops, open takes a file name and a, um, forget what it's called. Uh, flags, that's what they call it. So it's, a, it's an integer that specifies what mode, how do you want to open the file? Do you want it to be readable, writable, or both? And so uh, uh, this unistid header defines uh, some, uh, uh, some macros, some pound defines to stand in for read only, write only, read or write. And so I'm using this uh, this is what they called the read-only one, O underscore RD only. Not what I would have named it, but it's not up to me. Uh, and flags to indicate uh, mode. And the interesting thing about open is it returns an integer that just indicates uh, which file uh, uh, of the files the process, this process has open corresponds to this file2.txt. So we'll see what this uh, in, more, in more detail in a moment, but returns, and it's called a file descriptor, is that what, this, what we call this integer. That's why I've called the variable fd, um, uh, which is just an integer we can use to refer to this file that we've opened. So I've opened the file, I've uh, declared this uh, uh, array or, or string uh, 1024. I have a count, and I'd say uh, uh, count equals read from this file into my buffer 1024 characters, or up to 1024 characters. Read will return the number of characters that were read. And negative one indicates an error when uh, that, it, 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 that it encountered an error when reading. So if I uh, wanted to make this code robust, I might say if count is less than zero, return a negative number uh, indicating an error. Uh, I might exit the program, uh, and the number I give to, to this exit function, the argument is the exit code. And on Linux, an exit code of zero indicates this program finished normally. An exit code of anything else than zero indicates some problem occurred. And complex programs might have a bunch of different error codes that they return to indicate different errors that were, that were encountered while the program was running. So what I'll do here is, uh, so I've opened this, this file descriptor, uh, this, this file. And so what, is that, what does that actually mean? What Linux is keeping track of underneath is this data structure of uh, open files 
uh, that a process has, and then files that are open across all processes. So each process has this descriptor table, just an array, that the integer that we have as a file descriptor tells us which entry in that array that file corresponds to. And the entry there refers to some uh, a data structure the kernel is maintaining that has information about the open file. For example, this file position, that's our, our current position K here. And the kernel is going to keep track of that for every open file, which means that if a program opens the same file twice, there will be two entries in this open file table because it's going to keep track of the current position within that file separately, and once for each time a file is opened. The actual contents, information about the file, again shared by all processes, and the kernel only needs one of these for any given file. So we don't need multiple copies of the file's data in memory if we're, say, just reading it at two different places. This makes it pretty straightforward to say a program opens the same file twice. Once it open returns three, the second time open returns four. And there are two different kind of open file uh, uh, structures, but they both refer to the same uh, uh, entry in the, in the VNode table, same uh, part of memory that contains the actual information about the file. What questions do you have? Oh. Is there a way to stop access? <coughs> like, can I just ask to the open file and the program to FD1? Mm. So, this is, can we use these file descriptors to just access any file we want? Uh, each process has its own set of file descriptors. So my file descriptor 10 has to be something that I opened uh, and not something that some other process uh, opened for me. And uh, the part of the question, can we just do whatever we want with any files on the system. Uh, part of the Unix file system is that each file has associated permissions. So each file says, okay, this particular user is allowed to read this, or anyone is allowed to read this, but only this user can write to this file, things like that. So uh, you can have a file that can be read or written to by anyone, but Typically, the files are kind of only accessible to whoever created them. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, how come open is a distinct operation from read or write? Is there a situation in which you want to open a file before you read it? Yeah, good question. Why do we need to, to open uh, if we read and write? Uh, the answer is open is the, is telling the kernel to set up this structure so that the file is ready to be read or written. Um, so it does allow us to, uh, it simplifies read and write because it means the, the program has to tell the kernel, okay, I'm going to read or write this, rather than the kernel every read or write checking, oh, do I need to set up the file or is it already set up? Uh, so making those distinct is, is helpful in that way. You might also notice that we have these file descriptors 0, 1, and 2 that have these labels on them, std in, std out, std error, and every process Every process starts with these three files open, file descriptor 0, 1, and 2. And these are kind of the, the standard way that a, uh, a process can get input from the terminal or print out stuff to the terminal. So 
printf sends output <laughs> to standard out to this file descriptor one, because that's what shows up on the terminal. And that's just how every process <laughs> is initialized with a, a file descriptor one that is, is standard out. So uh, if we were to do fprintf, where we have to specify a file, and we said uh, print out to file descriptor one, it would be the same as, as printf. Printf just always sends it to standard out, whereas fprintf, we can tell it which file to send it to. And this is because on Unix, our terminal, which can show output, is treated as just a file in the file system. So we can write to it and read from it using the same interface that we read and write to any other file. So I'll show you uh, a little demonstration of that before we come back to uh, this, this files.c. So I have a terminal here open on AWB. Uh, and I can say, who am I? And it says, I am PTS slash zero. PTS is the, a graphical <clears throat> terminal. And I can open up another SSH to AWB, say, who am I? And this is PTS2. Well, if it's PTS, uh, if this other one is PTS0, let's see, proc PTS. Thought there was a PTS in here. <clears throat> oh, in dev PTS, there's zero, one, and two. So if I say send some uh, send some output into this file that is my other terminal. That works fine. Hello there shows up in the standard output of this other terminal because it's it's all just through this the file system. <coughs> the other way to look at this is to say these are both terminals, but they're also both running a shell process, something that is reading the commands that I put in and actually running them. And I'm using a shell called zish. So there's a ps command, which shows me uh, processes that, that are currently running on the system. If I want to run it with aux, it shows me lots of processes running on the system. And then I can use grep to search this for uh, zish, short for zshell. So I can see that the process running in PTS0 has ID 35584. So I can look at the data structures for 35584, all sorts of different things. I can look at the uh, file descriptors that it has open, uh, 0, 1, 10, 11, 12, so on. And so I can, uh, again, send some output to the uh, file descriptor one, the standard output for this, uh, this other, other terminal. And that was there. Oh. I'm not sure what that did. Uh, interesting. Oh, this is PTS zero. <laughs> so let me run this from the other one. And again, we're just writing to uh, uh, the standard out for some, some other process and it, and it shows up. So back to my um, uh, files.py, you can read from uh, uh, the file, but I can also read uh, from standard in, which I know is file descriptor zero. And uh, can read from, from standard in, and then uh, I can just write that back out to standard output. Um, 
write the buffer and write how count, which is however many bytes were actually read. So if I uh, GCC to compile my files.c, run files.c, it's sitting there waiting to read the input from standard in. And uh, if I uh, <coughs> use ps to find out, okay, what is the PID of my files program, 36618, okay, proc 36618, I can see that it has the standard 0, 1, and 2 open, but it also has a file descriptor 3 open because my files uh, .c program opened this other file and it just assigned it the first available uh, file descriptor because 0, 1 and, 1, and 2 were taken. And so this program is, is waiting for input, so of course I can again um, send something to its uh, uh, no. Uh, to its uh, standard uh, uh, in, and it printed it out. So, so I'll just to to illustrate that we have these uh, uh, standard in, uh, standard out, and standard error, which is uh, just a separate file that can that is just the terminal wh where you might print out error messages so that they uh, so that you can say separately get the error messages that a program outputted as opposed to its normal output. Questions on this? All right. So we've also seen uh, that, say, we can run ls and see the files that are, are in some uh, uh, some directory, uh, but we've also seen that we can redirect the output of a file. You probably use this in, in Lab 3, for example. And so I could redirect uh, the output of ls to foo.txt. I can look at what's in foo.txt, and it is the same, the same output that I got. So given what we know about file descriptors, how is this output redirection actually actually working? The answer <laughs> is calling this dupe2 system call to make one, take some old file descriptor and duplicate it onto a new file descriptor. So, for example, that our file descriptor table, again with our ls, to say foo.txt, uh, before we had, say, something like this, where our standard house was uh, going to some, uh, some file A, we had some other file uh, uh, open, and uh, when we say do to three one, this is saying make file one a copy of also refer to whatever uh, file three refers to. And so after this happens, our standard app has now been replaced with a reference to whatever this other open file was. So now anything that, say, would be printed out to our standard output actually goes to file B rather than A, which was our, our terminal, let's say. John? So if you copy something into zero for standard input, would it just like automatically be read by the next call to standard input? 
Uh, yeah, so if you, if you send uh, standard input to, uh, to a program, it, it uh, I believe it's typically kind of buffered, like buffered and then it's read by whatever the next, uh, whatever the next time standard input is, is read from. Other questions? All right, let's see how we're doing. So here is, is that code legible? Too small? Uh, let's see if I can, so. Um, uh, yes, here we go. So here is a larger version. And so I'm saying in a file, the file has A, B, C, D, E. And so uh, uh, the question is, in this code, uh, what will be printed out for a file with A, B, C, D, E? You'll notice that all of these um, uh, uh, Unix calls are capitalized, and then I'm including this csapp.h header it's because our textbook provides uh, versions of all of these calls that do some error checking for us. Uh, and so, uh, for example, in the uh, open call provided by this, uh, uh, the, the textbook library is it calls open and then just uh, checks whether the return code was negative um, and displays an error message if it was. So a slightly more convenient uh, uh, version of that. But take a look at this code uh, and think about what uh, will it uh, print out. Uh, this argv bracket one is just uh, a command line argument, so assume it's a, a file name has been passed into this program on the command line. All right, we're, we're divided between A and C. Please uh, discuss with your neighbors uh, how you're thinking about uh, what this code is doing. So a bit, of, a bit of movement toward A. This is indeed what is, what is going to happen. Uh, when we have these three open calls. For each of them, we're going to get a kind of open file structure. So when we open the file the first time, call this A, B, C. And remember, each of these is going to be keeping track of uh, a, a position, uh, where it is in, within the file. So given this uh, setup after the open calls, and someone uh, uh, share your thoughts on why this would print out A for C1, A for C2, and B for C3. All right. So what's it called do? That will change the four pointer to uh, point to C side. Because you, you do the right, so then you say look here. So then you have the point and then down there. And then when you say read one, not one, you'll see not one points A, which will be the first character A, which is A. And then you can read one from one, that now the like where you read your position will now be. I don't know if it's really that, so it'll now be the secondary character. And then when you say read one from four, well, four points to C, so it's the first one from C, which is A, and it increments the current index of one again. So when you say read one from FT3, it says, okay, FT3 is five, we move the first character from C, or we move the character we're adding C, which is the second one. Exactly. The each open file, when we read from a file descriptor referring to that, we're going to increment the position that we're currently reading in. So we end up reading twice from the third uh, time we open this file, so we can actually get the second, second character out of that. Questions on this? So, what was that last argument in read? What does that mean for one? 
so this says read from file descriptor one, put it into this character, and read one, one byte. Yeah, this third argument to open is not necessary in this case. Uh, if you are using open to create a new file, which is something you can do, it's a different kind of uh, flags that you pass it, you, there's some extra ways you can control, it, control its behavior. And so it can take this, this third argument. Other questions? All right, so let's talk about uh, uh, the other two uh, boxes we have, we have on this picture. So we talked about this, these Unix IO functions are open and close, read and write. And uh, what is it that the standard IO and this uh, robust IO are actually doing for us? So the standard IO, there's some amount of additional functionality uh, with kind of being able to format the output or to parse output using fscanf or fscanf. Um, but an important thing about our C library, uh, or an important thing about kind of this picture, is that Unix IO are system calls. Uh, can anyone remind us what system call means? John? Isn't that when it like, gives up control to the system and the system has to handle it because we don't want it to like, have permissions? provisions? Exactly. A system call is uh, a function call that turns over control to the kernel, the kernel does something, and then gives control back to the program. Uh, this is expensive, this extra work of transferring control, saving a bunch of information about the current process so that we can restore it when the kernel is done with its thing. We're talking about uh, more than <coughs> 10,000 CPU cycles. <laughs> Whoa. And so if, say, we're, we're reading along and we're making a, a read, a call to our read system call for every single character that we wanted to get from some underlying file, we'd be paying a, a huge overhead for all of those system calls. So our solution is buffered IO, and that is <clears throat> that we're going to make a call to our, our Unix function read every once in a while, fetch a big chunk of the file we're reading and put it in a buffer where you know, some part of it we will have already read and another part we will not have read yet and then calls to our standard library functions just read out of this buffer and then refill it with another read call uh, when we've uh, exhausted it. So it's just a way of, uh, uh, it's a similar idea to caching or pages that we've talked about. Uh, when we want to get some data, we get a big chunk of it, maybe more than we're asking for initially, so that it's around when we need more of it. So we get some, we start reading a file, we're gonna get uh, the four, first 4,096 bytes of the file and then put it in a temporary array, read out of that array as needed, and then when we've read all the way through it, make another system call to refill it. Does that make sense? So that's 
the but that, that and these kind of additional formatting features are the main thing that we get from our, our standard I.O. Um, what we don't get from standard I.O. is uh, dealing with uh, potential uh, problems with, with how read or write uh, uh, go. So, uh, for example, uh, we might try and read a thousand bytes from a file, but we only read uh, 300. And uh, if we're using standard I.O., we have to check for this occurrence called a short count. You read less than you expected and then retry to see, oh, <clears throat> did something, uh, was it interrupted or something preempted us on the device? Let's try and finish the read we're trying to do. This doesn't happen very often when we're like reading files from our local uh, disk, but if we're reading or writing information over the network, this becomes a big problem because network connections uh, as I'm sure you have experienced, not flawless, uh, they get interrupted. Uh, if it's wireless, there's interference from other radio signals, some of the information uh, doesn't make it. And so our standard I.O. functions uh, can be a pain to work with if we're in a situation where we might need to keep retrying, things might be interrupted, uh, and so on. So, one, uh, so that, that's what our Rio functions uh, do for us, is um, they have both buffered and unbuffered versions. So the ones that end in B are doing this buffered I.O. The ones that don't are doing unbuffered. And to see, to get an idea of what they're doing, I, the, all the implementations are in the textbook. I put the one for uh, Rio read here. <clears throat> and you can see that there is a while loop. So it's going to keep trying to read while we haven't read as many characters, as many bytes as we expect. Um, it checks if the read was interrupted by some <coughs> signal that the, the, the program got while it was trying to read, and will keep retrying. Or if it was some other error than just interrupted by a signal, it will, it will give up. And so instead of having to write all this sort of infra infrastructure ourselves when working with data over the network, we can use these uh, robust I.O. functions that uh, uh, our, our textbook authors uh, put together uh, to do this sort of retry until we've read as much as, as we, were uh, we want to. Does that make sense? Questions on that? So how does uh, our... Um, uh, th this, this is the code for one of these unbuffered versions. Uh, there's uh, uh, in the notes uh, a diagram for uh, how the, the buffered versions of this of this Rio uh, library work. There's a struct Rio T that keeps track of the buffer, where in the buffer we we're currently reading, how much of the buffer is left to read, and this is built on on top of the the Unix I/O that that we talked about. So we've gone through all these different I.O. functions, and that leaves us with kind of which one should we actually use? Uh, when would we want to use Unix I.O.? Um, If we need to have like really fine-grained control of what we're doing, or have the lowest possible overhead, that's what the, the kind of the raw system calls can give us. Other than that, <clears throat> uh, 
our higher level options are going to be are going to be a better choice. Um, if we're <coughs> We're working with disk files on disk or, or terminal files. We'll want to use the standard IO if we're working with data that's coming over network sockets. That's when those those Rio functions are going to be uh, going to be a, a useful choice. <coughs> All right, that'll do it for this class. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Finish up uh, lab lab four, uh, and I'll see you Monday. <laughs>